We're getting a look into the life of an Olympic track athlete. Plus, the WNBA will be entering a new media world with its next media deals. But Warner Bros. Discovery has not given up hope of keeping the NBA. It's Friday, July 26th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. The Olympics officially begin later today with the opening ceremony kicking off along the Seine River at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. We'll re-air for the U.S. audience in primetime at 7.30. NBC will have some 40 cameras on site to capture the full scene in Paris. Coco Goff and LeBron James will be the Team USA flag bearers. Warner Brothers Discovery announced on Wednesday that they intend to take the appropriate action against the NBA after the league rejected their matched offer in favor of Amazon. In their release, Warner Bros. contends that the league has, quote, grossly misrepresented our contractual rights with respect to the 2025-26 season and beyond. The sense is that this is headed to court. Despite the pending legal battle between TNT and the NBA, Amazon is reportedly interested in reassembling the cast of fan-favorite pregame show Inside the NBA, featuring Charles Barkley, Kenny Smith, Shaquille O'Neal, and Ernie Johnson. On Wednesday, head of Prime Video told Sports Business Journal, Obviously, there will be a lot of interest, and we'll just have to see how that plays out. Ernie Johnson has previously said he would not leave TNT. Major League Baseball has decided to rework their CBA to support teams that have lost money from TV deals. Teams that are in the red now qualify for cash infusions up to $15 million. That money will come directly from the luxury tax penalties collected by the league, otherwise known as the competitive balance tax pool. The MLBPA released a statement in support of this decision, suggesting that it will benefit players and free agents as well. Wells Fargo has announced that it will not be renewing its naming rights deal with the Philadelphia 76ers and Flyers Arena, which has donned the financial service company's moniker for the past 14 years. This comes off the heels of a report that Camden, New Jersey, was making a push for a new arena to house the 76ers. The NBA franchise will not stay in the same arena past 2031, but is pushing for its new home to stay within the city limits. The NCAA is eliminating by sports scholarship limits for athletes beginning in the 2025-26 season. Power Conference commissioners got together on Tuesday afternoon to finalize this new recruiting structure, which also included larger roster sizes for football programs from 85 to 105. Football, baseball, and softball will see the biggest changes from this decision. I'm joined now by Fitzroy Dunkley, Olympic medalist and now an online creator. Welcome, Fitzroy. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate being out here to talk about some sports. Yeah, yeah. Great to have you. So I just want to learn a little bit about you first. You won a silver medal in track in the 2016 Olympics in Rio. What was your path to becoming an Olympic athlete? Uh, it was a typical path of a Jamaican track and field athlete, right? You do track and field in Jamaica, which is part of the culture for us. I went to Jamaica College before moving on to Louisiana State University. While at LSU, I moved from doing a triple jump and high jump to the 400 meters where I found success during the 2015 season. In the 2016 season, I excelled a lot, you know, thanks to the help of my coaches, Dennis Shaver, Benny Brazil, and everyone on my team at LSU. And I made the Jamaican team by qualifying in the top three in Kingston. I moved on to the Olympics that summer in Rio, Brazil, which was a great experience overall. Trust me, I mean, I could talk about the Olympics all day, but in the 400 meters, we uh, competed and then in the four by four, which is where I got the silver medal. Um, we came together with I came together with three other guys and we ran a fantastic race. Finished second second in that race behind the U.S., which was just you know an awesome race and a memory that you know lives on forever in my mind. So that's a quick summary of um um how I got there. Yeah, that that's really cool. And so track is is a big part of Jamaican sports culture. It sounds yeah. like is it something that you know like kids who are athletic and that that they it's pretty likely that they'll they'll compete in some track events yeah yeah i mean track and field is big right we don't have all the other sports like you know the american football and nfl or the basketball it's not as big in jamaica track and field is something that we do lean towards and also football which you know americans call soccer that's pretty big in jamaica too but you find everybody try a little bit of track and field at some point during their sporting career and the fans just absolutely love it i mean we're an island of only three million people and we have such a large footprint overall um, in track and field. So it's only natural that all the fans in the island love it. But what's even bigger is that fans all over the world love Jamaica because of track and field, right? You know, it's not a lot of islands our size that's as popular. And track and field is part of that 
but also track and field is kind of encompass everything that goes to Jamaica, our food, our culture, our music. You know, it's just a popular thing in track and field, really just blends into all of that. And we also use track and field to show that to the world. So we love that, you know, track and field is able to give us these opportunities. As you can tell my story, track and field was able to earn me a full scholarship to um, LSU. And while at LSU, I didn't just do track and field. I also completed my degree in marketing and minor in communication studies and sports studies. Yeah, and I was just about to ask what it's meant to you, uh, you know, to be an athlete and, you know, an Olympic medalist. What's that meant, you know, you know years after you, you were competing at that level? You know, ironically, in every alley, he would tell you at the time when it happens, like, you don't think about it. You don't see what you're doing. It's really after the years that you competed, you look back and you're like, oh, wait, this was pretty big, you know. And in the, in the moment, you don't realize because you're just, you know, you're putting your head down and you're putting in the work and you're grinding to become an uh, Olympic athlete, much less an Olympic medalist, because what it takes to to step on that podium and get a medal around your neck, it just takes everything that you have. I mean, you the track and field really puts you in a position to learn all the skills that's necessary to reach a pinnacle of life. And obviously those skills can be used in other facets of life too. So it means everything. I mean, it's one of the highest achievements in my life, obviously. I'm still looking to, you know, outshine that with things that I might do in the future. Don't know how yet, you know, maybe I'll be a Olympic commentator one day or like, you know, working with the Olympics directly, but it's definitely a highlight of my life and something that will forever live on in my memory. It's an interesting situation that you were in and all these athletes are, are about to be in or are in right now where um, the world is watching them right now and they might, you know, play in a sport that doesn't, um, doesn't have like, you know, global reach most of the time. Um, what would your your advice be to these athletes who are they're they're having their fifteen minutes of fame literally you know where the the world's watching them and in a few weeks you know we'll we'll kind of be on to other things so yeah, yeah how, how should athletes you know take that moment with them and you know Owen that's a great question because I think that's one of the main things that I've been trying to push to athletes that's something that I didn't even know myself and I wish someone could tell me so I mean. Some actionable items I can tell you, just post as much as possible. As you just said, the eyes are going to be on you during this next two weeks. And you know how people are. They're going to quickly forget. As soon as the closing ceremony wrapped up, so does everybody's interest into these sports. So how do you get as much of these eyes to stick with you beyond that? You just got to show people who you are. You know, what are you competing in? Make these quick videos. They don't have to be these 30-minute interviews. It could be like a quick video of, hey, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm wearing. This is what I'm going to eat at the Olympics and let people get to know you and obviously highlight your performance. So what you want to do is build your personal brand. And that brand is going to be with you long term. For me, I can still talk about a lot of the achievements that I've had. That's part of my personal brand that I can now use as credentials to talk about sports now, years later. I mean, the Rio Olympics was eight years ago. And here I am still being able to use that credential as part of my brand to talk about sports. So at least should know that even though the Olympics isn't itself, it's not going to pay you, you can build that brand that you can eventually profit off. Do you think the Olympics should pay their athletes? A hundred percent. I mean, that's a, that's a gimme, right? Do you think the NCAA should have paid um, student athletes years ago? Back, I, I, I went to LSU in 2013 and it was foreign to even think that the NCAA would have paid athletes, right? People would have been like, no, you're already getting this scholarship here. Now we're in 2024 and it's standard. Matter of fact, it's a, it's a part of the recruiting process. So are we going to be having this conversation about the Olympics um, 10 years from now that people are standardly getting paid? So um, I will say, I'm not sure if you know, Owen, but the World Athletics, which is the governing body for track and field, is going to pay the Olympic champion $50,000. And as far as I'm aware, it's the only governing body for a sport that's having any type of award for um, a winner at the Olympics. Thinking about, you know, the evolution of the games and of track, um, you know, it's only been eight years. This is only the second Olympics since since the one you were in. Do you feel like the games have evolved or is it still basically what you remember from Rio? From what I can see, it's pretty much the same. I mean, it's, it's hard to evolve from where it's at, right? It's one of the biggest global staging in the world. It has the brand. It has the edge in the people's mind who aren't sports fans. Like the, the main goal of any sport is to get that casual fan to be a fan. You know, and the Olympics gets that every year. Like, there's people who I know will never watch sports for the last four years, but once this three weeks during the summer comes, they're locked in. So the Olympics is already doing what it's supposed to do. All it has to do now is maintain the brand. Is there some some room for innovation? 
Yes. I mean, obviously, there's always room for innovation. I think it's doing a little bit. Uh, in 2028, as we've seen, they've added a few sports, right? So I think that type of things is just include having um, innovation come in, having new new sports, new athletes come in, and you're going to obviously bring in new fans with those new sports. Um, it will be in America, so obviously, like, flag football is going to be in there, and that's going to be something that's unique to the American society, which is a big sports uh, society. In the next Olympics in 2028, track and field will be on the on during the first part of the Olympics, as opposed to now where the Olympics kicks off tomorrow, but track and field will be a week later. Um, track and field is called athletics during the Olympics, and it's either the number one or the number two most popular sport or most watched during the Olympics. So it only makes sense that you move it up so fans who are eager to watch that particular sport can see it even earlier. So innovations like that help, but I think the Olympics is, is where exactly where it should be. Some innovations that they should include is paying at least more, letting at least get a piece of that pie, even through some type of gain share opportunity. Do you think track can grow to be something that people are, are fans of, you know, beyond, you know, your more casual fan can, uh, can get engaged with beyond the Olympics and the biggest competitions? Track hasn't, taking an advantage of every avenue that it could, right? Is it doing everything that the NFL and the NBA do, is doing right now to push the sport? No. So until we do all those things and fail, then the answer has to be that, yes, there is an opportunity for us to become that mainstream sport where people are keeping up with 24-7 outside of the Olympics. So there's new things coming on the horizon. There's new track meets that's coming out. Track and field is getting more investments. Michael Johnson is having a league now that's going to be you know, housing some of the biggest names, they're going to put it in a competition format that, you know, consumers can keep up with and understand and buy into track. And hopefully that league expands into something where more friends are coming in. He can include more events. He can include more more um, athletes. And I think that would just be a win-win over off a track. And that that's part of the ways that it can get into that. So I think that question is well-timed because track and field is at that position currently where people are trying new things and trying to get it in front of those casual fans. Because I have this firm belief that if you're a fan of the NBA, the NFL, or you watch soccer overseas in Europe, the Champions League, then you probably will be a fan of track and field also because, I mean, I think track and field athletes are some of the more the more purest athletes, you know, it's all about that that backyard. Who can run the fastest? And these are the athletes who are the fastest in the world. They're faster than any of your favorite basketball players, football players, soccer players all over the world. Fitzroy Dunkley, thanks so much for joining us on the show. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. All right. Joining us now for his podcast debut is front office sports reporter Colin Salau. Help, welcome, Colin. Hey, Owen, it's cool to be, be on after listening to you for so long. All right. Yeah, great to have you on. So we've got plenty of news to get to. But before that, uh, let's just get to know you a little bit. I am just very curious what it's been like for you being a Washington Wizards fan with, as my understanding is, with no connection to the D.C. area. No connection. I've never been to D.C. in my life. <laughs> I don't even know if I'm going to be there within the next like year or so. Um, it's been weird, but I think because I grew up internationally, I grew up in the Philippines and you kind of just choose a team. And I grew up with my uncle telling us that the best player in the NBA was Michael Jordan. So mm -hmm. he just so happened to be a wizard when I was a kid. Then that, right. you know, <laughs> um, but it was hard to grow. I, it's still hard now. I get made fun of. Again, it's a fun fact to go on a podcast when you're a Wizards fan. So, right. Yeah. yeah. But it, it, it's not fun. But yeah. Um, you know, maybe we'll have better days. Here's the Cooper flag. Yeah. Cover. All right, there you go. And yeah, excuse my ignorance here. Have have they like ever been good? Like in the I don't know in your lifetime. Um, yeah, uh, the best was in I think 2017. We made the conference, uh, the the uh, semifinals, and lost to the Celtics in seven games. We haven't made the All conference right. finals since the 70s. Speaking of basketball, the WNBA and NBA announced their rights deals with ESPN, NBC, and Amazon. Um, WBD, owner of TNT, still has something to say about um, the NBA saying they, that they failed to match Amazon's offer. Maybe we'll get into that. But for now, we will uh, assume that those are the, the NBA and WNBA's media rights partners going forward. Um, what do we know about the details of this deal on the W side? Yeah, I think it's it's interesting on the W side. So we, we've kind of expected that, you know, they get a chunk of this deal. Um, the NBA, because they own about half 
of the WNBA kind of just creates the valuation for the WNBA. And in this case, um, yeah, in this case, the NBA's total deal goes up about like 2.67% uh, 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 times the original deal. Um, for the W, theirs goes up above 300% or above three times more than um, its previous deal of about 60 million. So that's a positive, um, at least in, 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 in the top line level. Um, but, you know, we've already heard from the likes of Cheryl Miller and even the, the, the top uh, brass of the WNBA PA that, you know, maybe this could be uh, not exactly, you know, good down the line. It might end up being something that is undervaluing the league down the line. Uh, but I think ultimately it is still a win. So we've known those details for a while. But I think one of the shocking ones also that I wanted to mention is that the WNBA finals will not be exclusively aired on ESPN networks anymore. Um, the, the ESPN networks have had the WNBA finals since 2003 exclusively um, and have even at least aired one game of the WNBA finals since its second season in 1997. Um, so now ESPN networks are going to have about five of the 11 years of the WNBA finals in this deal, um, while um, three will go to NBC and Peacock and three will go to Amazon Prime. I think that's a little bit interesting that ESPN is willing to share the WNBA finals. Their president of content, Bert Magnus, said in a podcast to The Athletic last month that um, they think that it, that, that it would be a positive for the league to have a different level of distribution. So it seemed like it was going that way. Uh, but it's, it's shocking to see those details, I think, now. You know, if, if you're the, the W, probably NBC is, you know, you're at least for now, the, the most desirable spot because it's broadcast. You can everyone can get that. Um, you know, ESPN, obviously, it's familiar. It's it's still, you know, tens of millions of people um, have no problem tuning in there. Um, the most interesting side of this might be Amazon. Um, it provides legitimacy for them as a broadcaster to have a the finals of a major league. And um, um, yeah, it'll just be interesting to see if if the the WNBA lifts Amazon, if Amazon can lift the WNBA and just how that relationship evolves. Yeah, I, I wanted to say, you know, the, the WNBA has been with Amazon since I think 2021. Uh, at least they've had the, the Commissioner's Cup, the, the WNBA's um, in-season uh, tournament um, of sorts, which the NBA eventually adapted. Um, ever since that was um, that that tournament came about in 2021, Amazon was a partner to air the championship game. So they've had kind of this relationship. Um, and so I, I assume that means Amazon has seen the behavior of fans to be willing to come in and watch this game. But considering the boom of the league with, with Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese coming in, it's going to be really interesting to see uh, the WNBA finals, albeit still in 2028, I think, uh, seems to be the reports for the first time it's going to be on Amazon Prime. Yeah, and I think it kind of makes sense for both sides to have it not be the first finals right out of the deal um, so that just Prime's got a little bit more of a chance to establish itself as a sports broadcaster. Obviously, people are already watching Thursday Night Football and other stuff on there. But uh, yeah, I think the W doesn't want to have its first finals in this new deal on on a streaming service and not on anyone's TV. Yeah, Amazon's going to be happy if by 2028, it's uh, it's Caitlin Clark versus Angel Reese in the finals. You know, Warner Bros. Discovery is still attempting to, to stay in this picture here. Um, assuming that the NBA is successful in going with the deals that they just announced, um, or what, what kind of bidding war do you think we'll, we'll see for the inside the NBA crew, which, you know, say what you will about the, the decline of cable, that's still like the, the most beloved you know, NBA show. Yeah, I mean, it's it's going to be, uh, I think our, our reporter on front office sports, um, Mike, Michael McCarthy has talked a lot about how strong this is going to be a line, how much of a line there's going to be for Charles Barkley in particular and the rest of the team potentially at inside the NBA. So I, I would see a world where all these new partners from Amazon and their deep pockets all the way to, you know, ESPN even, who Charles Barkley has, you know, said some things about in the past. I, I wouldn't be shocked if they all came in and lined up for them. I think for Charles Barkley in particular, who is probably the gem of the team, um, it's going to really revolve around, obviously, the money. But also he's mentioned, you know, the schedule. He doesn't want to work 
you know, he's in his 60s. He doesn't want to work all the time. He wants to be given the flexibility. So I wouldn't be shocked if, you know, maybe ESPN tried to find something in that or Amazon told him, hey, we don't have that many games. You can come here. Um, but the other thing I think is is interesting is that um, Charles Barkley, in all his public appearances about talking about this, has has often mentioned the production team and how much he values everybody else that makes this show run. Um, and there is a world, and I've seen you know people thinking you know either Charles Barkley brings in the rest of the staff, uh, the, the staff, and or uh, the 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 four, the four of them at the at the helm into his own production company. There's also a world where you know maybe Amazon brings in majority of the people from TNT um, to, to just basically recreate inside the NBA. So I'd be interested to see you know there's so many different directions where this could go. Um, if I had to make a prediction, I wouldn't be shocked if it was Amazon Prime simply because of the deep pockets because I think that Charles Barkley alone will start at about twenty million dollars. Yeah, and that would be a very Amazon move to just you know, spend what they need to, and and also to take a pre-established product that people already like and just put it on Amazon as opposed to the Apple move of just trying to make it make it all feel like you're you're in the world of an iPad. And to your point, I think it's the credibility building. You have you know the big the best studio show perhaps of all time into your into Amazon. Automatically, everyone's going to look at Amazon in a more positive light. That you know people are already looking at streaming a little bit. Um, you know, with, with a little bit of hesitance that you bring in the most beloved show, everyone's going to love you. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for making your debut and joining us on the show. Thanks for having me. Angel Reese is set to become the next year round women's professional basketball player. Wednesday, Reese announced that she would be joining Unrivaled in the offseason, a three on three women's league started by the Minnesota Lynx's Nafisa Collier and New York Liberty's Brianna Stewart that offers WNBA players the chance to earn a salary in the offseason. Three-on-three basketball has surged in recent years, ushered in by the Big Three, founded by rapper Ice Cube in 2017. Unrivaled will begin its inaugural season this upcoming January, during the heart of the WNBA season. It's coming at the perfect time, where interest and funding for women's basketball are at an all-time high. Alex Morgan, former U.S. national women's soccer team captain, has been instrumental in raising capital for the league through her company Tribe Ventures. Angel Reese is the first rookie to participate in the new league, but joins a list of 10 other WNBA players, including superstars like Kelsey Plum and Jackie Young. The WNBA will be a major winner of the NBA's new TV deal, but discrepancy in player salaries with male counterparts have been a large point of discussion this season. For reference, the largest annual salary in the W is 252000 compared to $55 million in the NBA. The outcome of the NBA's new TV deal is still up in the air, but one thing is certain, NBA's version of Red Zone is coming to ESPN. On Wednesday, the broadcast giant released a statement that detailed their new 11-year agreement with the association and the W. Much is what we expected, but there was one line that's drawing some extra attention. ESPN's rights to launch new NBA studio show featuring whip-around coverage on game nights. The idea is not something entirely new. NBA TV began a similar show titled NBA Crunch Time in 2015, hosted by Jared Greenberg. It is unclear who would host ESPN's version of the show, but seems unlikely to be Greenberg, who is under contract with Turner Sports. It might not be seven straight hours of commercial-free football, but NBA fans have to be happy that this crunch time format could hit the mainstream in the next few seasons. Fanatics is denying reports involving its revenue, its CEO, and $1 billion. Specifically, Airmail reported that CEO Michael Rubin is looking to offload $1 billion in his stake in the company, and that Fanatics' revenue for the year will come in at around $6 billion, a notable drop from last year's $7 billion. Fanatics denied both of those reports, that saying that Rubin is not looking to sell any of his stake and that revenue is projected to be $8 billion this year. Because Fanatics is a private company, we won't necessarily get a straight answer on this anytime soon. While Fanatics appeared to be heading toward an IPO not too long ago, the company says it is not a focus for the time being. Meanwhile, Fanatics is facing legal battles on multiple fronts, namely an antitrust suit against Panini over Fanatics' takeover of the trading card industry and a dispute with DraftKings, which claims that Fanatics induced an executive to violate a non-compete clause. Puck reports that Fanatics could experience fallout from the NFL Sunday ticket verdict, which challenges the league's ability to make group licensing agreements for all of its teams. Fanatics has apparel deals with the NFL, MLB, NBA, and NHL, among others. With a dominant presence in apparel and trading cards and a major investment in sports betting, Fanatics wants to be everywhere that sports fans are. That can come with a lot of headaches. 
That's it for today. I am going on vacation, but the show will go on. We are welcoming our senior producer, John Shane, to the job by letting him also do my job for a week. You'll also hear some interviews I recorded recently. Thanks for listening. Enjoy your weekend. We will see you on Monday. Monday.